Wasps are often portrayed as one of the bad guys in the insect world, but part of that common misconception comes from a lack of knowledge or understanding about wasps in general and stereotypes that don't apply to most wasp species. The truth is that wasps are extremely diverse. As you'll hear in this episode, there is even a wasp that lays its eggs underwater. How crazy is that? What most of us think of when we think about a wasp makes up only the tiniest percentage of all wasps out there. In fact, there are likely many different species of wasps that haven't even been identified yet. And wasps play an extremely important role in the ecosystem, one that is often overlooked and not very well understood at all. During this episode of the Backyard Ecology podcast, we talk with a self-proclaimed ambassador for wasps as we dive into the fascinating diversity of wasps, especially parasitoid wasps, and their vital roles in the ecosystem. Nature isn't just out there in some far-off exotic location. It's all around us, including right outside our doors. Hi, my name is Shannon Tromboli, and I am the host of Backyard Ecology. I invite you to join us as we ignite our curiosity and natural wonder, explore our yards and communities, and improve our local pollinator and wildlife habitat. Hi, everyone. Before we get started, I wanted to thank all of my supporters on Patreon. Their monthly donations help make Backyard Ecology possible. If you would like to join them, please visit my Patreon page. I'll have links in the show notes for the Backyard Ecology Patreon page, blog, YouTube channel, and email list. Today we're joined by Louis Nastasi. Louis is a PhD candidate at Penn State's Frost Entomological Museum, which is Penn State's research collection of insects and other arthropods. He also founded and is one of the instructors for the WASP ID course, which I'm sure we'll talk about more later in our conversation. Hi, Lewis. Welcome back to Backyard Ecology. Thank you for talking with us again today. Hi, I am so excited to be back. It was a great time in my previous episode talking about galls, and today we will talk about wasps in a more general sense. And I'm really excited to hopefully open people's eyes uh, to the idea that uh, not all wasps are bad, which is always a a common thread that comes up when discussing wasps in basically any context. Yes, exactly. And I'm really looking forward to this conversation because the last conversation was so much fun about galls. And if I understood you correctly in that conversation, wasps and your passion and love of wasps is really what led you to studying the galls, which means talking about wasps is your first passion and should, should just make it even that much more fun. Definitely, definitely. Now, like you alluded to, a lot of people aren't exactly fond of wasps, we'll put it. Um, definitely can't say that wasps are a passion of theirs, but I think that's something that you can definitely say. So what is it that made you passionate about it? How did you first get interested in wasps? Yeah, that's a really great question, but I think before I answer that too deeply, I want to address why people generally are not fond of wasps. So before I go through why I find them so interesting, I think it's important to highlight some of the general reasons for why they're just probably the least popular insects. Um, spiders aren't insects, but that'd be the only thing I'd consider to be less popular than wasps. Um, so a couple of reasons for this just really frankly, bad reputation that wasps are often subjected to. Uh, one of the reasons for that, and something we'll touch on a lot today, is people only interact with a couple species of wasps on a regular basis, and those just so happen to be the annoying, harmful, and in some rare cases, uh, dangerous species. Uh, you know, immediately the word wasp evokes the idea of yellow jackets, hornets, all those weird little buzzy black and yellow critters that, you know, the second you open a can of soda or food outside, they swarm you immediately. They are immediately annoying, frustrating. Even I, as the wasp guy, uh, get a little annoyed sometimes when they're buzzing all around me trying to, you know, work outside or things of that nature. But that is probably the biggest reason I say people have a bad attitude about wasps. They think wasp and immediately connect it to 
Yellow Jackets and Hornets, which are ubiquitous, especially in urban and suburban landscapes where people are often living or just out and about. And, you know, they're, they sting. It's painful. I've been stung before. It's not a remotely pleasant experience in the slightest. And between the ubiquity, the annoyance, the stinging, you know, people obviously will get not such a good impression of these insects. And one thing we'll discuss today is that those are only a couple species of wasps. The greater diversity is tremendous. And most of them not only will not sting you, but are probably a lot more interesting. I hope people would find them more interesting than just buzzy, angry sky demons is often kind of the the general tone. Yeah. (laughs) Yes. And for me, when I think wasps and what gave me the bad impression of wasps as a kid um, was those big red paper wasps and the black, big black paper wasps. Mm. Those were the ones that I was my first encounter. I honestly, until I was like in college, probably didn't even think of yellow jackets and hornets as wasps. They were hornets. They were something else. And I think a lot of people have that same sort of impression that yellow jackets and hornets are something else, not bees, not wasps, but their own little thing. Um, Or at least a lot of people I talk to have that impression. But yeah, it was those big red and big black paper wasps that when I got close to the nests as a kid, because they were always up in the eaves of the porch and stuff like that, they would buzz me or come after me, chase me, it seemed like. Um, And they hurt when they sting. They really hurt. So yeah, that's what gave me my bad impression of wasps. And then even today, I'll be honest, when somebody says wasps, that's the first thing that comes to mind because it's hard to change a lifetime of thought. Um, But then immediately after that comes all the cool little different wasps that I've learned to appreciate and really like. So yeah, there is this negative connotation with wasps and not even a full understanding of what they are. I completely agree with you there. Yes. So one of the big things, I I don't want to give too much away. I feel like all of these questions makes me want to say so many things that I kind of want to hold on to for a bit. But with what you're saying here, a lot of it comes down to semantics and how we communicate about insects. So one idea of wasp might be different from someone else's Um, later in this show, I'm going to provide an actual definition for wasps. And I think people will be very surprised by the scope of what a true definition of wasps actually includes. Mm -hmm. Uh, Before we get into that, though, I do want to answer your previous question about why I found wasps to be so interesting and why they've kind of engineered my my interest in entomology and insects and galls as, as a whole. So I'll start by saying that when I first got interested in insects, wasps weren't really on my radar. Uh, and that was mostly because, you know, as a, as a kid, as a younger adult, you know, when you mostly experience science through public facing resources, things like documentaries, books that are not necessarily written as scientific publications, things of that nature, there is definitely a bias toward not only which wasps are talked about, but how often they're talked about at all. So I definitely resonate with your experience there. You know, if you asked me t- even 10 years ago, what wasps were, I'd probably say, oh yeah, yellow jackets, hornets, paper wasps. And that would be like the upper limit of my knowledge. And one thing that really got me interested in wasps is start slowly reading literature, working in an insect collection as an undergrad and so on, you get to see all of a sudden pretty, pretty abruptly that your that idea of wasps, that general societal average person definition of wasps is just, ooh, I don't even know if I, if I've ever said something so objective, it's wrong, just completely, completely wrong. The idea that wasps are yellow jackets, hornets, paper wasps is like the furthest thing from reality. Uh, so my first professional experience in entomology, when I was an undergrad, I got a work study job working at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, doing some specimen management and digitization. So I was taking label data from mounted insects, at that point, mostly moths, and basically inputting that into a database to be publicly shared. And through that job, just working in that insect collection, seeing specimens, talking to people, it was really obvious that 
and this is a more universal thing than just wasps, but like the public's understanding of insects is like the tiniest little sliver. I can't even gesture to how tiny this truly is. It's the smallest little segment of what's actually out there as far as insects. And perhaps no group exemplifies that better than wasps. So wasps to me are really this exemplar for kind of knowledge that is sealed away from the general public that only by becoming engrossed in entomology and an understanding of insects knowing how they work how they look their diversity it's almost like this unlocking moment that you experience I've personally experienced this and many others seem to have as well from my conversations it's this moment where you're like wow that is just completely contrary to my expectations and that driving force to me is something I still find myself developing through wasps because for me the transition went from having a broad interest in insects to a narrow interest in a type of entomology working in collections that's transitioned into working with wasps eventually uh, when I was an intern at the Smithsonian one summer I was working specifically on the ichneumonid wasp collection which is just one of many many types of wasps and through that experience that makes you aware not just that there are other types of wasps but all of a sudden you start to learn there's this wasp and this wasp and they're all these radically evolutionarily different groups that have completely different biologies completely different lifestyles found in different places using different host insects and it was just this explosion of diversity and like i said even today i'm learning that you know this particular species does this crazy thing that is not found in other species or in other cases, and gall wasps are a great example, they're descended from parasitic wasps, but have taken up this herbivorous lifestyle that may have actually arisen independently multiple times and then gone back to parasitism in some cases. It's just this really complex interwoven tapestry of ideas all relating to wasps and just that sense of almost, almost the sense of ambiguity is what makes me so intrigued by them because there are so many dimensions to it how it's not really a monolith which you know we often assume living things are a monolith so all butterflies and moths generally get lumped into a monolith as in you know moths fly at night butterflies fly during the day and like we're, we're we love putting things in tiny little boxes that fit expectations and wasps just break out of that box tear it to pieces and do crazy crazy things and i know i've kind of blabbered on about this for a while here but i think just the most interesting aspect of wasps is just how much they do how many of them there are and just how little of that is often exposed in the public eye and that's kind of touches on what got me interested in them is just starting to see that there are different types of wasps and they do different things and all the different like you said, all the different lifestyles of them. Uh, there are wasps that can't even sting a person, which is like something I never would have even dreamed of. And I'll add to that, the vast majority of wasps cannot sting people. Not just, not just a few, not just many. Uh, if I had to estimate the number of species that could sting a person relative to the whole of wasps, probably about a fifth of known wasps fall into the stinging category. Wow. Yeah, that's, I knew there were more than, I didn't realize that was that much more than that weren't able to sting us. And we'll talk about how that number itself is probably a drastic underestimate a little bit later too. Uh, rather, the, the ratio of non-stinging to stinging wasps is probably much higher than is currently known. But it is, I mean, they're just so fascinating in their diversity, the way they look, their sizes, their colors the different lifestyles they have is it is that and the behaviors that they have it's that diversity in all aspects which is really fascinating and started to draw me in and get me more curious absolutely and i'll add that in this episode in particular like i've alluded to wasps is this like enormous enormous topic um so this is this conversation is really just going to scratch the surface and, you know, if you and your listeners are interested, I am happy to come back and touch on every little tiny facet <laughs> of WASP because I have a feeling that this conversation is going to go in one direction and we're not going to be able to escape. And it's going to be only a, t I keep saying this, it's only a tiny sliver. This is going to be even tinier of a sliver than anything else I've mentioned so far. 
But hopefully my goal for this conversation is to introduce the true diversity of wasps, both in species and in function, and then hopefully uh, introduce some information that will slowly wear away at the bias that I'm expecting many of your listeners uh, are still holding on to in regard to wasps. Right. And it's a bias that, quite frankly, I know I had for a long time. And it sounds like you may have started out with two and have already let go of the bias. And I mean, I, I'm, Definitely. I've let go of the bias, but I'm not as far down the road as you are. And to, to be fair, it is, it is a valid bias. From the, from the perspective at which humans interact with wasps, it makes sense that those species are the ones that are most commonly interacted with, the yellow jackets and the hornets. It makes sense that people find them frustrating. And one of the reasons for that is most wasps are not insects people would immediately look at and think that's a wasp. And that itself leads to a lot of confusion. Again, we'll define wasps here in a minute, but if you don't know what a wasp truly is, the few that you do interact with, the few that you can you know, snap your fingers and readily identify, those become the proxy for wasps. And in that, I think that bias that most people carry is completely valid. There's nothing wrong with that because it's simply a lack of, of almost public recognition of wasps. And I've kind of started to view myself, not to sound silly, but almost as the ambassador to humans of wasps, just because, again, they're just crazy creatures. And just that lack of knowledge, I think, is really why that barrier exists, why people either fear them or are not fond of them. And that's definitely the main motivator that has made me so interested at, at this point. Well, I guess you, we should go ahead and define wasps, because it's hard to talk about something if we don't even know what it is, which is what you just alluded to. Absolutely. So uh, if I were to give you my own definition of wasps, we'd be here for a long time talking about itty bitty aspects of evolutionary phylogenomics and insect morphology. But to give a broad functional definition of wasps we can use here, wasps are members of the insect order Hymenoptera that are not part of several groups recognized as sawflies. So uh, not to get too deep into it, uh, sawflies are another type of wasp-ish insect. Uh, they're plant feeding. They're called sawflies because many species have on their uh, egg laying structure, the ovipositor, they have little teeth that they use to drill into plants to lay their eggs. Um, and they're the ancestral uh, group of Hymenoptera. Until recently, they were considered a suborder, but evolutionary studies have shown us that that's a misleading classification. But suffice it to say that wasps are any member of the order Hymenoptera that is not a sawfly. And that's kind of an ambiguous definition. I'm guessing most of your listeners don't know what a sawfly is, so that's not the most helpful. Uh, but I am going to illustrate this a little bit further. So when we think of wasps uh, as a whole, again, we think of those few species. What I want you and your viewers to do in this moment is kind of remove yourself from that context, erase your slate of your wasp definition. And I'm going to do a brief walkthrough through wasps in general, uh, as far as major groups and general biologies and so on. So the most prevalent type of wasp in nature is not the yellow jacket, not the hornet. They are what are called parasitic wasps or parasitoid wasps to describe their biology more accurately. And parasitoid wasps are insects that will lay their eggs in or on another insect. Those eggs will hatch, the larvae will feed on that host insect and then develop into adults and repeat that cycle over and over again. And there are many types of parasitic wasps or parasitoid wasps and that diversity is one of the key drivers of modern ecosystems. And we'll get into that in a while. But the parasitic wasps, or the vast majority of wasp diversity, is it's over 100,000 species currently described, and probably many orders of magnitude uh, more than that. We'll get into all that fun stuff later. But other types of wasps uh, include predatory wasps, or what we often call solitary wasps, uh, things like uh, hornets. Uh, and yellow jackets are social wasps. So that's yet another little category. But what I want to get at here is even just in broad categories, there are lots and lots and lots of different types of wasps. So to provide a more robust definition, I want us all to consider that wasps are, and we're going to do a little bit of uh, insect anatomy here. Wasps are members of the order Hymenoptera, not sawflies. 
and they can be recognized as not soft lies because they have what we call a pediolate abdomen, or more precisely, a pediolate metasoma. And what that means is there's a narrow constriction between the apparent thorax and abdomen of the insect. So if you look at any wasp, if you Google wasp right now, and you look at any insects, provided that they're correctly identified in Google images, you will notice that between the second and third body segments, not the head, there's a distinct constriction, uh, what we call the wasp waist. Uh, and that distinct constriction is basically a universal identifier of wasps. So it's, again, it's kind of hard to provide a really robust, perfect definition. Um, but if you see an insect, it's in the order Hymenoptera, meaning it's vaguely wasp ant bee looking-ish. And it's got that constriction, that wasp waist, it is a wasp. So uh, I just mentioned wasps and bees for the first time. And I have uh, been very careful to avoid mentioning them so far. Uh, normally I'd explain this in a bit more of an evolutionary context, but you might notice that wasps, uh, bees, and ants, as we conventionally define them, all fit that definition I just provided for you. Mm -hmm. All three of those groups are not sawflies. They're in the order Hymenoptera, and they have that wasp waist. And uh, this is often where I see people kind of change their tune on wasps. Uh, that is because bees and ants are true wasps. They are part of the evolutionary group that is classified as wasps. And when we were talking about semantics earlier, this is one thing I was getting at where because we call wasps one thing, call bees one thing, and call ants another thing, we think of those as really distinct kind of compartmentalized groups in our heads. We don't consider them to be one thing, even though they're all members of Hymenoptera. And we've known for decades, if not centuries, that they are true wasps in their evolutionary capacity. And they're so specialized in what they do. You know, we think of ants as being these eusocial colonial masters of their environments and bees as a bunch of different things too deep to get into in this episode but we consider them to be so separate because of their level of specialization not because there's something truly distinct from other wasps so when people are saying wasps are bad you know they're thinking of their own tiny little sliver of the macrocosm of wasps and that by definition excludes bees excludes ants excludes many parasitic wasps. And that leads to, again, a lot of this bias where we, if we think of what wasps truly are, the diversity they truly include, the evolutionary pathways that have brought these insects into the modern era, it's a really different picture than what the public seems to understand. So out of my own curiosity, would you say that that is the definition you've had of wasps in the past? How does that align to a more typical definition? Yeah, I never had that definition as a um really for a very long time even beyond college because I didn't take entomology as an undergrad but yeah I always thought of wasps and bees and ants and yellow jackets and hornets all as their separate thing and even once I learned that they were all hymenoptera and were all so they were all related to each other I still thought of them as being kind of their own separate pieces and then even after I learned that okay the ancestor for bees was a wasp and they're basically a branch off of the wasps I still didn't have that with ants I still didn't realize until very recently that ants were a branch off of wasps I thought that ants were still kind of their own thing mm, absolutely so I will add here that, you know, these insects all classified in the order Hymenoptera, you know, there are many subdivisions. So if you just look at the scientific name of, of ants, uh, what, what we call the family formicity, you see a different name than if you would look up a wasp. So there is definitely, you know, multiple layers. It's not until you look at an evolutionary tree that you actually start to see that level of connection. So I don't want to say there's almost like a conspiracy involved here, but like it's clearly many, many factors interacting that obfuscate this true idea of wasps and that bees and ants are wasps, hornets and yellow jackets are wasps. And that's an interesting one. I haven't heard that before. Usually when wasps are brought up, I hear it in the context of yellow jackets and hornets. So that is, that is an interesting one. I haven't heard that before. So that's pretty neat to get yet another perspective kind of in my 
wasp wheelhouse for lack of a better way to phrase it um but that is definitely uh, compelling that you slowly over time kind of independently come to that same conclusion and that is definitely not the norm i'd say that probably 90 percent of people listening to this podcast would hear bees and ants or wasps and kind of sit there thinking are you sure about that um i promise it is <laughs> um but it definitely more of an outlandish idea and moving on from there, what I do want to highlight is the true diversity of wasps. So I mentioned a bit about different biological modes that wasps have, a bit about how there are many different groups. Um, when we look at the taxonomy of wasps, meaning the scientific classification, there are many, 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 many groups. And that's even if you completely discount bees and ants. So I mentioned these parasitoid wasps. Uh, perhaps you're all wondering why I'm using the term parasitoid. Um, I often use parasitic interchangeably. It's a, it's a term that generally resonates more with people than this more specialized term parasitoid. But the reason we call them that and not strictly parasitic is, you know, when you think of a normal parasite, you think of a, a tick is usually my kind of um, champion for parasites in that way. You know, it finds a host, it lives on that host, and it re relies entirely on that host for resources. When we talk about a parasitic wasp, um, the adults will lay their eggs in a host, uh, the eggs hatch, the insects develop, and then they leave the host. So they're only exploiting the resources of that host for that initial stage of development where they go from egg to larva to pupa and then emerge and they become adults. Um, so that kind of host reliance, either you know, for a tick being, it ob obligately needs the resources of that host for its entire life versus a parasitoid that has a free living life stage is one way we can separate them. Uh, the other way to think about it, and I think this is a really interesting kind of evolutionary story, um, if we think about what is in the best interest of a parasite, right? The parasite needs to be able to continue to use host's resources. And if that host dies, then that parasite is, you know, without mode of survival. It is very bad for a traditional parasite if something happens to that host. And, you know, it's, it's easy to, to think of examples where, you know, the number of parasites ends up killing a host. But again, it's in, the, it's in that parasite's best interest for that host to be relatively healthy. And we see that in things like um, ticks, mosquitoes, more typical parasites where, you know, they've evolved mechanisms to prevent them from doing too much harm. And of course, you know, it's not a 100% host survival rate. That's just impossible given nature and the kind of randomness of a lot of biological events but generally evolutionarily a lot of true parasites have converged on this idea of trying to be as minimally invasive to the host as possible but in parasitoids like these wasps they lay their eggs in there they do whatever they need to do they often kill the host almost always actually and then they just go off and go on with their lives without a regard for the obligate survival of that host so because there's a limited window in which they need to exploit that host insect. They really don't care what happens to that host. And it just so happens that often just by developing, needing to feed on that host. And then uh, I, would like to, I would like to mention the movie Alien, one of my favorite movies. If you think of these xenomorphs in those movies, not only are they based on parasitic wasps in part, but if you think of the chest bursters, not to get too gory here, you know, there's this kind of explosion where the alien exits its host and leaves a big hole in, in the human in that case. Wasps pretty much mimic that exactly. Parasitoids kind of do that little burst. I mean, probably not as exaggerated, obviously not Hollywoodified to be this kind of abrupt explosive event, but they exit the host, chew their way through, and then fly off. They open their wings and they fly away to either may uh, continue the cycle and so on. Um, so that parasitoid method that many wasps undergo is really key to their biology. And within parasitoidism, there are many, many types of parasitoids. And usually it's dependent on where the parent wasp lays its eggs. Uh, it depends on the host insect on which the eggs are laid. It depends on whether they're uh, deposited under the surface of the host or internally within the host. It depends on what life stage the host insect is at. Basically, a bajillion different factors all influence how parasitoid biology interacts. And what we see is, in the case of most parasitoid wasps, they are often specific to the host insect. So one species of parasitoid will often have a preference for 
one species of host or maybe a few species of hosts. Um, and then each of those other biological aspects plays off of that. So what we get is many available niches, even within a single host insect for possible parasitoid wasps to exploit and use and develop in those hosts. So if we think of, what's a good example here? Let's think of butterflies as a good example. They're kind of the most iconic insect undergoing complete metamorphosis. What we see with wasps is a caterpillar of one species uh, could be a host to multiple parasitoids because there might be a parasitoid that prefers to lay its eggs on the surface of that host. Another one might lay eggs inside that host, uh, maybe at different instars or different molting stages. So that right there is a number of different niches available for parasitoids. Uh, then we look at the pupa. Other parasitoids might prefer to oviposit their eggs into developed pupae, not into the larva, not into the adult. And then there are also parasitoids that might prefer the adult insect as an ideal host for its eggs. So if we think about one species of butterfly or moth, that's already, you know, three, five, ten, a dozen, a hundred different possible niches that parasitoid insects, particularly wasps, can exploit and use as a motivator for evolution, speciation, and so on. So I'm not going to get too deep into the evolutionary mechanisms here, but one key point that I want to get across is wasps basically fulfill any biology you can imagine, um, often related to parasitoidism specifically, but I also mentioned predatory wasps earlier. There are social wasps like the yellow jackets, hornets, and paper wasps that you're all probably familiar with. There are a bunch of other weird lifestyles, uh, but the true driver of diversity of wasps is that kind of multifaceted, many-dimensional parasitoidism that th uh, the vast majority of wasps exhibit. And to go even deeper, there are all kinds of really amazing parasitoids. One of my favorite examples is there are a few species of what we call the fairy flies. They're wasps belonging to a family called Mimeridae. And some of them are parasitoids of diving beetles. And they do this really awesome thing where these wasps, usually less than a millimeter long, can swim to find oh, wow. eggs of diving beetles. So there's a really great uh, David Attenborough documentary uh, clip on this that you all can look up. But what they'll do is, you know, these are so tiny insects, so like flying is already hard, but they will go into the water and they will literally use their wings like paddles to propel themselves and in, uh, search through the water using chemical cues for the eggs of diving beetles, lay their eggs in the diving beetle eggs, and then exit the water to continue their life cycles. It's truly, truly incredible. And that's like, to me, the most outlandish example, because not only is it, you know, really, really tiny insect doing weird things, it's a parasitic wasp that has a pretty interesting host already, uh, being these diving beetles, but then they actually enter the water and can navigate in the water to their host. It's just mind blowing to me. And then I think of, you know, what led them to do this? Because this is like an incredibly specialized biology. You know, most parasitoid wasps don't swim, which I-, I, I No. Most wasps don't swim. But that's just like crazy to me. And you have to think about the evolutionary events that needed to occur to not only, you know, come up with a tiny parasitoid wasp that is compatible with diving beetle eggs, but a tiny parasitoid wasp that survives in water long enough to not only locate and find host eggs, but then lay its own eggs in there and then get out. Like the number of layers, the, the amount of potential for the butterfly effect to come into play here is like completely unprecedented. Like there's nothing else like this type of interaction. And, you know, that's not even that weird for wasps, which I know might sound shocking. And we don't have time to go into all my favorite examples today, but like they do wild, wild things. Yeah, that is absolutely incredible. Now, and I'm going to have to look that up and I'll try, if I can find that video, I will put the link in the show notes because I'm sure I'm not the only one that's going, wait a minute, I've got to see that. Um, so are these, you said they were fairy flies? Yeah. So they're, they're called fairy flies, but they're wasps. Okay. So there's kind of this weird trend in insects where basically everything is called a fly. <laughs> uh, so like dragonfly, butterfly, turns out they're not flies. <laughs> uh, and you can actually tell pretty easily based on the name. And this is a a fun fact I tell my intro entomology students, if you look at the name of an insect with fly in it, if it's all one word, it is not a true fly. So dragonfly is one word, butterfly is one word, fairy fly is one word. But if you looked up 
you know, bee fly or hover fly. Those are two words every single time, mm -hmm. which I think is just, why did we decide that? Who came up with that convention and then who followed it? That to me is bizarre in itself. But are these native to the U.S. or where are they found? Yeah, so this, this family of Mamarity, the fair, uh, fairy flies, is really, really poorly studied, but they're found worldwide. Uh, I'm not sure exactly where the diving beetle associated species occur, mm -hmm. but this is a group that is basically omnipresent everywhere. If you are like me and you're out there trying to collect tiny wasps, if you use the right methods, you will be astounded of how many of these tiny critters you can find. They're so small, they're so imperceptible, you'd barely notice them unless you knew to look for them. And this highlights one aspect of wasps that I want to touch on today. Wasps are everywhere, even if you don't realize, even if you don't notice them. And the main motivator for that is most of them are really, really, really small. Most are in the one to five millimeter range, the vast majority. So when you think of a yellow jacket, that is like the, a comparison between a gecko and Godzilla when it comes to wasps. And I mean that quite literally. We have wasps that are as small as a tenth of a millimeter long. And, you know, you think of the largest wasp, things like tarantula hawks, you need a ruler in inches to measure those. So it's a completely different order of magnitude when it comes to size. And that's one reason uh, for which, you know, people don't really realize the diversity of wasps is you never look at a moving speck of dust and think, hey, that's a wasp. Cool. It's just never that conversation. And that level of kind of recognition is also something that I that many people, including myself, think has kind of prevented us from learning more about wasps. So if we think of kind of the start of modern science, the start of modern entomology in the, the late 16 to early 1700s, people are focused on big, pretty, showy insects, things like large beetles, butterflies and moths. And, you know, people just didn't really think to put that much thought into really tiny kind of nothings of insects. I really hate to call them that, but that's really what they are. I mean, I have my drawer of gall wasps over here next to me. And the average person would look at these and think, no way there's an insect on there. And these aren't even that small for wasps. So that factor alone has contributed to a lot of paucity in our knowledge of wasps only because, you know, something's got to one, be appealing for people to want to study it, two, be easy to find and collect. And if you're really tiny, that's difficult. And three, just like catch your attention in a very general sense. And now that we know so much about wasps, it's really easy to tell people they do these crazy things. They're cool. But, you know, imagine being someone in the early 1900s without this really tremendous understanding, without things like photos to show people, you have to pull out these tiny wasp specimens and be like, I promise there's something really cool on that little piece of paper, but you can't see it. You got to take my word for it. Just that level of dissonance, I think, is tremendous and something that, you know, people don't often think about. And that definitely has led to us having kind of a poor understanding of wasps in a general sense but it's also greatly affected our understanding of their biodiversity. And as I've alluded to already, wasps do lots of cool things, usually relying on their host insects, and all those mechanisms have led to a tremendous diversity of insects uh, in the parasitic wasp groups especially. And currently, uh, many of you might be familiar with the idea that beetles are currently the most diverse animal group in number of species. Uh, there are a few studies. Uh, one of my favorites is a study published by Andrew Forbes and some collaborators, uh, which we can link in the show notes. Uh, that was published in 2018. And they model uh, host relationships between host insects and parasitoid wasps and find that there's just a tremendous possible diversity of parasitoid wasps to the point where moderate estimates for the number of extant parasitoid wasp species usually range from one to three million. Uh, oh, and wow. to put that in, in, into perspective, there are about 1 million described species of animals, all animals on Earth. Uh, and that's, you know, not that many when you think of what else is out there. And of those described animals, only 150,000 or so are hymenopterans, and only about 120,000 ish are true wasps. So if we think of it that way, we're somewhere between five to 10% of describing the total diversity of wasps on earth and have a lot of work to do to get anywhere near that uh, estimate there. And also contributing to that estimate is something that I have not yet touched on, 
We talked about how parasitoid wasps use many different hosts, but there are many parasitoid wasps that also use other parasitoid wasps as hosts, what we call hyperparasitoids. So this is the part of the show where I want to break out, you know, one of those uh, mystery show serial killer whiteboards where you take the, the red string and put it between everything. Like, that's what I feel I need to have as kind of a visual aid for this. Because what we have now is a tremendous diversity of possible host insects, a possible diversity of what we call primary parasitoids, those that are kind of the first level of parasitoids. And then from there, we can draw additional levels above looking at hyperparasitoids, these wasps that rely on parasitoids already in those same hosts. And, you know, when we consider all these things, we end up at just terrifying estimates for what wasp diversity can look like. And what I like to say is, you know, we think of beetles as being really diverse. Uh, it turns out that if there are that many beetles, there are probably that many wasps that can interact with these beetles in parasitic manners. And then we think, wait, it's probably not just one type of parasitoid per host species. And all of a sudden, how could beetles possibly be as diverse when there's this kind of self-fulfilling prophecy in place where wasps have short generation times, often multiple generations a year. They're out there constantly reproducing, constantly experiencing pressures of natural selection, and through that constantly evolving to new forms and new biologies to the point where, you know, it's not really possible for other types of animals to keep up with them in a strict sense. And through that, I mean, I think it's inconceivable that a group of animal is more diverse than parasitic wasps, just period, full stop. And this uh, Forbes study from 2018 is a great first step in projecting that possible diversity using mathematical models of host parasitoid ratios. And that's just, to me, just fantastic that we're slowly developing ways to really demonstrate just how diverse these insects can be in a strict sense. Yes, exactly. And the whole idea of those hyperparasitoid wasps, the ones that paras parasitoid other parasitoids is just incredible because like you were talking about with the diving beetle parasitoid wasps those fairy fly ones you think about it and all the things that have to come into play to have that happen or for them to even find the host because now they've got to find a parasite that's in its host so you got to find the host and then you have to find the one that's been parasite and, and just the layers that you have to put on there for the hyperparasitoid wasps to even exist. It's just incredible once you start thinking. And I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm wanting to grab the whiteboard or something that where we could start drawing it out. And because when you get into this stuff, it really does help to be able to see it. Definitely. And I'm going to blow your mind a little more here. There are more layers than we've discussed so far. So there are multiple layers of hyperparasitoids in many systems. So what that means is, a parasitoid wasp could be a parasitoid of a parasitoid wasp of a parasitoid wasp of a parasitoid wasp of a beetle. And that, as we currently understand it, may actually be fairly common. And again, as you've alluded to, and as I've, as I've alluded to, there are so many inconceivably small events that need to occur in order for these types of biologies to develop. Because what we're looking at you know, the, the, the misconception humans have is we know we know everything there is to know about nature and all the things that we're currently observing have existed for a long time. And that's not necessarily correct. So what is really interesting about wasps in particular is what we're seeing is this snapshot in time where these ecosystems exist as they do. So we're seeing maybe the one millionth in the universe, or trillionth, quadrillionth, octillionth, probably even a smaller number, honestly, of the time in, you know, history that will come to exist where parasitoid wasp number one attacks parasitoid wasp number two which attacks number three which then relies on this specific beetle to drive its its biology it's like it's just inconceivable to me that like these systems exist and it's just really amazing to be able to sit here and observe these things and think about them in a strict sense it's just mind-blowing and then we get into the idea of what are called tritrophic or tetratrophic interactions, where it's not just parasitoid to host that matters. There's also uh, many species of parasitoid that will only attack a host, uh, given that it's living on a certain plant or living in a certain habitat type. So for instance, in the world of galls, uh, this is somewhat well studied. I see that in my silphium gall wasps, 
uh, depending on which host plant a particular gall wasp is on, it attracts different parasitoid communities, which is mind blowing again, wow. because that means that that wasp can distinguish not between possible host species, it can distinguish between those host species based on what host plant they're living on. It's just, again, we've opened up another another whiteboard entirely. We got to put it up next to the other whiteboard. We need to start putting string between the boards now. It's just absurd to me. And again, this is only scratching the surface. This is my this is my one hour elevator pitch for wasps. And if we wanted to, you know, we could be here for thirty or forty years, just highlighting interesting examples, highlighting cool things that wasps do. Because if 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 you're if if listeners right now find what I'm discussing so far entertaining. This is like, this, this is nothing. This truly is nothing in the grand scheme of what wasps can do. And I always like to think about if we know all this, what do they do that we don't know about? Because as I've mentioned, wasps are really poorly studied and we already know all these crazy things about them. So what will we find out, you know, in a year or in five years or in 10 years when we study both new species we might be discovering, but also species that have existed for centuries that have been known to people like like Carolus Linnaeus in the 1700s and so on it's just so fascinating and I want to transition from that into a discussion of why wasps are so important and why everyone listening should be worried about the health of wasps on earth so yes as I've mentioned wasps are often parasitoids they're host specialists and because of that they act as uh, I often frame this as the natural pest control system uh, in basically every ecosystem on earth in which insects occur, which is, as I'm sure most of us can guess, basically all of them, at least all of them on dry land for the most part, parasitoid wasps have probably the most important role. I often frame wasps as probably the most important animals in modern day ecosystems uh, because of this pest control capacity they have. So if we think of how many different pest insects or just general insects wasps can attack and interact with, that's a lot, probably all of the species on earth. And wasps exist in tremendous numbers in nature. Uh, they often will lay dozens to hundreds of eggs at a single time. And they will often, uh, through the laying of those eggs, eliminate dozens of possible hosts. Uh, and by doing that, they basically act as a natural suppressant to abundance of most insect species. So if you imagine, uh, bear with me here, we have... Uh, random insect species, there's some weird caterpillar living in a temperate forest in North America. Uh, and all of a sudden, all the parasitoid wasps for that species are gone. We go from having maybe, you know, 30,000 caterpillars present in that forest to millions of caterpillars present in that forest, just by the lack of this kind of natural suppressant mechanism. And, you know, what impacts might those caterpillars have on that ecosystem in the absence of wasps? What trees might they be killing, eating, extincting even in some rare circumstances? What basically massive cascading effect could the absence of even a single parasitic wasp species have on a system? Yeah, because like in moths and butterflies, only one egg and a hundred or more is likely to make it to the adult. Absolutely. And, and so if you start taking out these predators, whether it's the parasitoid wasps or which is often the case, but there's others as well, Absolutely. then suddenly it's an explosion and you actually have habit, have larger issues being created there. So yeah, Absolutely. that's a very good point to bring up. But all that to say, people need to care about wasps a lot more than they do. I know it's hard, I know it's so deeply ingrained in so many of us to think wasp bad, but we need to step away as a society from that idea. And I know it's hard. It's not easy. I know it's not a, an instantaneous, you know, flip of a switch decision, but it's really, really important that we change perspective of these. And we are actively trying to change the tide with wasps through things like the wasp ID course that I'm currently uh, directing and running for our second session this year. Courses like that and other similar initiatives will help people to understand the diversity of wasps in their ecosystems, enable people to better identify the species that they have, maybe in their gardens and their communities, and overall change the tide against not only this negative reputation, but be able to identify cases where a species might be harmful or, you know, worth removing, etc., versus those that are truly beneficial. So 
a lot of the responsibility now falls on us as scientists to be responsibly communicating these things, making this information accessible to the public, which to be fair, a lot of it is not inherently accessible. That's a big challenge that we, especially in the WASP world are dealing with, but WASPs, uh, they need a better public opinion and they need it badly now more than ever before. Yes. And real quick, because we're running out of time here, um, I want to give you a minute to talk a little bit about the WASP ID course, because it is coming up. So for those people who are listening to this towards the end of 2022, can you tell us a little bit about the class in case people do want to dig in and learn a little bit more? Absolutely. So the WASP ID course is an initiative that I started last year. Uh, we ran our first session in January of 2022. Uh, we had so many participants. It was outrageous. Uh, but what the course does is our goal is to provide an accessible treatment of WASPs in terms of how to identify them, a bit about their biology, how you can collect and preserve WASPs for scientific study, all these different topics pertaining to WASPs. And the great thing about our course that makes it pretty unique is it's entirely virtual, which presents some unique challenges as these types of courses are usually taught in a traditional face-to-face -face classroom. But it also allows us to engage the global community in a way that quite frankly has not been done before. So our past session had almost 340 students, believe it or not, joining us from all around the world, every continent except Antarctica from about 40 countries. And those students were introduced to a taxonomic treatment of every single extant superfamily and family of wasps, including their biology, how you can collect and study them, how you can identify them, as well as many introductory topics like what is the morphology of wasps? What parts of the wasp are important? How do you interpret the structures present on wasps? How can you preserve them properly to ensure that they are available to the public and serve as a voucher for the existence of nature in this state and time? All that fun stuff covered in this online course. Uh, this year, uh, our January 2023 session is scheduled for the first two weeks of January. That's the 9th through the 20th of January 2023. And to aid in kind of general accessibility, uh, the course can be taken entirely asynchronously. So we do have live synchronous virtual sessions through Zoom, but the course is constructed in a way that makes all content available to students on demand without needing to attend any of these synchronous sessions. And the great thing about this course is even though it's two whole weeks and virtual, we are uh, hopefully providing very accessible course costs. Uh, normal registration is $50 for this course this year and student registration is $40. There are also a few other options available, but uh, not to uh, toot my own horn here, but I think we've created a really unique resource that is both low cost, globally accessible, and provide stable standing resources for students interested in learning more about WASPs. So if you're out there and this sounds like an amazing fun time, you wanna learn about all the WASPs there are, you wanna interact with a global community of people that also wanna learn about WASPs, you can go to our website, which is waspidcourse.wordpress.com. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter at waspidcourse, um, or you can also email us for more information at waspidcourse at gmail.com. And we can include links to that in the show notes. Uh, registration is currently open uh, through January 1st of this coming year. So if you are interested in this, uh, feel free to check us out. Uh, we would love to have more people to revel in the glory of wasps, which uh, as our tagline says, are the earth's most exceptional animals. And just to kind of, give people a little bit better idea of what they might be in for with this class. Um, I know I sat in on one of your virtual learning sessions about the class yes. and it sounded really, really interesting. It did. But for people like, well, like me at this point or others who may be listening, who are interested in wasps, who would like to be able to identify more of the wasps that they see around the house, kind of the same way that you identify birds or butterflies or something like that, and then learn a little bit more about them, but who has very little, if any, entomology background. Is this the type of class that's for them, or is this going to be a little bit more technical and scientific? Are we going to get lost in it? I think that's an important question. 
So that is a phenomenal question and one we've explicitly developed the course to address. So as far as the prospective audience for the course, I say it's really cut and dry. I would ask someone, are you interested in insects? And if their answer is yes, then they should uh, look into the course. It is not designed for people with existing entomology experience. Although, you know, if you have experience, it would obviously be helpful. Uh, but you could come into the course uh, not even knowing what a wasp is. And I'd say you probably would do pretty all right. So some of it is technical, but we provide uh, sufficient resources that in our opinion will bring you up to speed pretty quickly. We have lectures on every introductory topic from what is a wasp to introductory taxonomy, uh, introductory phylogenetics, uh, general biology, insect preservation, curation, how to collect insects. We go from the top all the way down through everything. And if a question is not answered by our content, uh, we also have, uh, well, all of our content is shared through a Google Drive folder. And that contains not just our lectures, but also abundant additional resources, all kinds of guides, links, reference lists. We will do our best to make sure that any person that wants to learn about WASP through this course can do so in a way that is both maximally accessible to them and in a way that meets their interest and skill level. So it's built right into the course. I'd say if you didn't even know what an insect is, you might be able to pull this off. We have done our best to make sure that it's accessible to anyone. And of course, uh, we will be available via email through the duration of the course for any specific questions. We, we are here in this course because we just love to talk about wasps. And if there's anything we can do to make any of you more excited, get you more interested, make it a better experience, we are here to do that. And I will add through that, it's not just me uh, delivering this course. Uh, I, along with three course runners who are kind of the executive board of the course, are joined by 15 additional instructors from around the world who have their own expertise in various areas relating to insects and wasps and all deliver their own lecture sessions. And I will add one more thing. We're developing a textbook to go along with this course. Uh, it's not finalized yet. We're still editing it as we speak, but this is meant to be kind of the first uh, more introductory resource to wasps to the non-entomologist. So we're hoping that between all these different things, we are creating what is truly a general audience type course that is also appealing to those with more specific knowledge already. Okay, awesome. <laughs> and that's not an easy thing to do, I know, is to appeal to all those different knowledge levels and to be able to meet people wherever they are coming in. Especially it. virtually. It's oh, yes. uh, our first run went really well, but we've already pinpointed a bunch of stuff we can improve. We've even been addressing things like possible language barriers through some uh, new methods we're implying. We are pulling out all the stops. We are really in this to make it the best course possible, no matter what that means. That is great. Yes. And like you said, we'll have links in the show notes to all of that, plus all the different things that we've talked about so far in this. But Thank you again so much for joining us today. This has been, again, a really interesting conversation. This has been amazing. And I'm really, really glad that I am slowly over time spreading the, the glory of wasps to a broader audience and hopefully inspire you in your pursuit of more knowledge about insects, especially wasps. Yes, hopefully it does. So, yes, thanks again and have a great day. Thank you. You as well. All right. Bye-bye. I appreciate Lewis taking the time to talk with us today. His passion for wasps and wasp education definitely shines through. His comment about not seeing a flying speck of dust and saying, hey, look, there's a wasp, made me laugh. But it also highlights some deeper issues. First, there are so many different organisms that we don't pay attention to, don't know much about, or maybe don't don't even realize that they exist at all because they aren't flashy, pretty, big, or charismatic. This has come up in other conversations too, but it is an important point that I believe deserves more attention. How can we even hope to preserve or protect a species if we don't even know it exists or don't even know basic information about it? Second, I see it as a good reminder of the dangers of using a handful of species to categorize literally thousands of other species. The handful of wasp species that are so often villainized are social species, 
which have completely different life histories and behaviors than the vast majority of wasp species. And while you definitely don't want to disturb the nests or threaten those handful of social wasp species, even they aren't out to get us. In my opinion, the two most important points of this entire conversation are one, that wasps are extremely diverse, and two, Wasps play vital roles in our ecosystem. If you want to learn more about wasps, I encourage you to check out Heather Holmes' book and Lewis's Wasp ID course. There are links in the show notes to both. There's also a link in the show notes to the video of the fairy wasps that we talked about and several other wasp-related clips from the same show. If you're looking for some simple, quick, and easy ways to attract pollinators to your yard, you may want to check out my newest book, Attract Pollinators and Wildlife to Your Yard, 15 Free and Easy Ways. Visit the webpage for this episode to learn more about the book and to place your order. Until next week, I encourage you to take some time to enjoy the nature in your own yard and community.